Uh, this is the uh, 17th out of the 20 classes that we're going to have here in Kawa 126, the, uh, on the eight cases that changed America. Uh, this is week nine of 10. So we're right uh, closing in on it now. We're uh, coming to the top of the home stretch here. Uh, and I told you on uh, Thursday, uh, on, the, on the 24th, that we were going to be discussing the Iran-Contra case uh, in three separate parts. The first part was the pre-filing investigation that we went through to, to determine what it is that we believed uh, was going on, basically, prior to filing. Then today I would be addressing the, the pre-trial uh, uh, discovery process and further investigation, the post-filing investigation. And then in the, on the third of the three days that will be on uh, next Thursday, we'll be discussing the appellate process, the congressional investigation, the special prosecutor's investigation, and the, uh, the, the media uh, responses to all of this. But uh, to, to really understand and appreciate what we were confronted by in attempting to craft the actual complaint in the filing that would contain uh, the information that we wanted to get in front of the American public in the court and ultimately a jury. So the jury could make a series of special findings of fact uh, that would in a sense put a cross section of America in the jury box to pass upon a whole series of uh, historically controverted uh, information. And so to understand what it is we were actually confronted by, uh, it'll be necessary to actually tell you prior to getting started with what we did after the filing, I wanna do just to give you a couple short uh, immediate post-filing uh, stories to set the context so you see the scale and scope of what we were dealing with. The first of them uh, is this, is that uh, we filed the actual complaint on uh, May 29th of 1986. It was uh, just uh, a day before the two-year expiration of the statute of limitations uh, uh, predicated upon the bombing at Lepenka, where the journalist, the ABC television cameraman, and the others were seriously injured, and uh, six journalists were killed. Uh, that uh, We filed the complaint on, on a Friday uh, afternoon at about 4.30. And uh, the following Monday morning, I came into my law office in Washington, D.C. at our little uh, cobbler shop that we, that we had there. And, uh, and my, uh, my secretary, uh, Patty Austin, said, there's a, there's a, the judge is waiting for you on the phone. And so she brings me the phone, and the judge says, uh, hello, Mr. Sheehan. This is uh, James Lawrence King. I'm the chief federal judge in the Southern District of Florida, in Miami, and I have your case in front of me here, the complaint that you filed on Friday, uh, and I'm uh, calling you to talk with you directly. I, unless you are in front of me, physically here in my courtroom by two o'clock today, I'm going to summarily dismiss this complaint. He didn't give any reasons for it. He didn't give any legal argumentation on behalf of it. He just said that. And he says, I just wanted to make sure that you knew this, so I was talking to you directly, and he hung up. So fortunately, I had a suit there in the office, and so I dashed to the closet and pull out my suit and jump into it, and I raced down to the still then National Airport uh, and get a flight to Miami. And I fly down to Miami, jump out of the airplane, get into a cab, and rush over to the federal courthouse and go swooping upstairs to the federal courthouse and come hook sliding in at about quarter to two. And uh, there's Judge James Lawrence King sitting up on the bench uh, waiting for me with a clock right there, looking at the clock. And, uh, and uh, there's a raid out in front of him, uh, two dozen uh, lawyers all sitting there on Monday morning, uh, basically, after the filing on Friday afternoon at the end of, uh, end of the court day. And, uh, and James Lawrence King says, Mr. Sheehan, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome you here into the, uh, into the circuit court, or into the court down here. And I'd like to introduce you to the lawyers that are going to be representing the defendants in your case. He said, uh, here, here we have uh, Mr. Anthony Lapham, 
Mr. Lapham is going to be representing Mr. Adolfo Calero, the man whom you allege in your complaint to be the head of the FDN Contra forces uh, in, in Honduras, attacking uh, the, the government of Nicaragua. Said, so that's Mr. Lapham. He's going to serve as chief counsel. And I was saying to myself, Anthony Lapham, Anthony Lapham, he, Anthony Lapham, he was chief counsel for the Central Intelligence Agency under George Bush, senior when George Bush Sr. was the director of the CIA in 1975, 76, and 77. I said, this is a very interesting guy to show up here. And then he says, uh, Judge King says, and here, representing Ronald Joseph Martin Jr., whom you allege in your complaint, to be the source of the illegal end user certificates for the military equipment that you say was being smuggled from Fort Lauderdale Hollywood Airport here uh, down, into, uh, down into Central America, he said, the lawyer that's going to be representing uh, uh, Ronald Joseph Martin Jr. is Mr. Williams here. And he said, uh, you may recognize his name because uh, he was uh, actually the, the chief assistant United States attorney in charge of the criminal division here in the district until last Friday afternoon at uh, five o'clock when he retired. And uh, he just has decided that he is going to be now going into private practice and he will be representing, uh, representing, uh, I said, professional criminals, Your Honor, I think is the term you're looking for. And he said, now, Mr. Sheehan, he said, I don't want to have any of that in this case. I've heard about you, he said, and I want to make it clear that everybody in this case is going to conduct themselves as a gentleman. And I wanted to have you down here because I wanted to tell you in person, face to face, so there's no doubt about it, that I have placed your complaint under seal. Uh, and that you are going to be forbidden to talk with anyone about the mere existence of this complaint. You can't talk about any of the charges that have been made in the complaint. You can't talk about any of the defendants that are in the complaint. Uh, I'm letting you know right now that uh, if you do, I'm going to hold you in direct criminal contempt of this court, and I will sentence you to prison for six months. I said, really, that's kind of an interesting position, Your Honor. I said, exactly, on what do you predicate that? He said, well, you may not be familiar uh, with the rules of procedure here in our court down in Florida. I said, well, I assume they're the same federal rules of civil procedure that apply everywhere else, which my professor Shapiro happened to have written when I was with him in uh, law school. I said, so I'm pretty familiar with these. I said, but I don't know what provision you're talking about. He said, well, you know, there's a provision that, uh, that allows a judge to have some discretion in, uh, in taking care to be able to select an impartial jury. And I don't want anything to be said anywhere publicly that might end up getting back into the press and it would taint a potential jury pool that people would have heard about the case. Uh, so this was a rather extraordinary position he was taking. So I said, well, Your Honor, I said, I don't agree, I don't agree with that at all. He said, I didn't think you would. He said, but I wanted you to be here in person so that you knew on the record that this is what the conditions were. And I said, I understand, but uh, I said, I don't intend to abide by that because I don't believe it's constitutional. He said, well, uh, if you're going to be admitted pro hoc vici to practice here in this case, you're going to have to abide by that or else uh, I will remove you from the case. So I said, okay, I'm glad we understand each other. Are we done here? And he said, uh, yes, that's all. And so I got up and walked out. So I went, I went back, I flew back up to, uh, back up to Washington, D.C. And uh, the following morning, uh, I come uh, into my, into my uh, office. And uh, Patty Austin says, uh, Danny, there's a, an older man here to see you. And I said, well, well, who is it? He said, I don't know. I didn't get his name. And I said, well, where is he? He said, well, he's up in your office waiting for you. So I said, okay, all right. Um, so I go up to my office, and here's this guy, maybe about 70 years old or something, is there. And I, I go in, uh, and he reaches out his hand and shakes my hand. He says, good morning, Mr. Sheehan. He said, uh, look, he said, uh, let me, let me uh, ask you a couple of questions here. He said, I've got, he goes over and sits down, and I go back over and sit down behind my desk, and he reaches into this bag, this bag he's got, and he, he opens up uh, the bag, and he takes out a copy of the complaint, which is under seal down in Florida. He says, I've got a copy of your complaint here, and uh, uh, I, I want to ask you a couple questions. You don't have to answer them, of course, but if you do, I might be able to help you. Uh, and so I just decided, okay, uh, let's see what this is. And he said, now, can you tell me, he said, of the 26 defendants that you've named here in your complaint, can you tell me who you think the most important single defendant here is? I said, oh, that, that would be easy. I said, it's right here. And I point to Theodore Shackley. 
And he says, he looks and he says, oh, that's very interesting. And he said, and why, why is that? Why do you consider him the most important? I said, well, a lot of people would think that it would be because he was the ADDO. He was the Associate Deputy Director for Operations in the CIA under George Bush Sr. When, C when George Bush Sr. was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency back in 75, 76, and 77. He said, and because he directed all covert operations worldwide, a lot of people would assume that since there's a lot of covert operations involved in this case, that that's why I would have named him. And so he sits back and he goes, yes. I said, but? I said, but that's not the reason that he's the most important. And he said, well, what is the reason that you think he's the most important? I said, because he was the chief of station in the Miami CIA station on November 22nd of 1963. And he just looked at me like this, and he, he said, there are, there are five people in the world that would have answered that question that way. He comes over, and he gets out of his chair, and he puts his hand out, and he, sits down, and he, sits, he says, hi, my name is Dick Billings. I was a chief of staff for the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And I think that uh, we can help each other out. Said. So that's, that's how I got to meet Dick. And so Dick said to me right away, he said, look, there's a fellow that I want you to meet. Uh, it's going to be important for you, I think. Uh, and I want to I help you on some of these things. So would you meet me for lunch? Would you be willing to have lunch tomorrow? I said, sure. He said, where would you like that to be? I said, how about the Dubliner, right down at the bottom of Capitol Hill? He said, fine, 12 o'clock. I said, right. So the next day... 12 o'clock, I go over to the Dubliner Cafe, and I walk over there, and there's, there's Dick Billings standing out front. So I walk up, and I shake his hand, and we turn, and we walk into the Dubliner. And we come in there, and there's not many people in there yet, and there's this older guy, maybe 72, 73-year-old guy, sitting all by himself at this table. And so Dick Billings walks me over to the table, and he says, uh, Dan, Dan Sheehan, he says, uh, this is uh, uh, Joseph Smith, he says. And I said, <laughs> so I reached out and I said, oh, great. Yeah, Joseph Smith. And he goes, no, yes, I get that a lot, he said. But <laughs> it's true, that is my, that is my name. Uh, and, it, and it turns out to be Joseph Buckholder Smith. And he sits down and he says, uh, look, he said, uh, I knew, uh, I knew in, when I was in graduate school, I knew Dick uh, at Princeton. I said, but I'm an old uh, Harvard College guy, and I thought, you know, I was talking with Dick about your case, and uh, there was some stuff that he thought I ought to tell you. I said, fine. And he said, well, he said, back in 1973, he said, uh, I was the deputy CIA station chief in Mexico City. And uh, that was the point in time at which uh, Theodore Shackley had just been made the head of Western Hemisphere operations for the agency. Uh, he'd been taken out of Southeast Asia for some uh, thing. He said, you wouldn't know what that is or anything. And I said, oh, I know perfectly well what that was. And he said, I don't think you do. And I said, well, I do. And he said, <laughs> he said well, what was it? And so I told him the story about Colonel Rowe and those guys that were all involved in, in assassinating that young CIA, uh, South Vietnamese CIA guy, uh, and that the agency had taken, him, taken Shackley out of there to get him out of the crosshairs because Creighton Abrams was after him. And uh, so I explained the whole thing to him. He said, well, that, that's, yes, that, that is what it is. And I say, he said, well, I was the deputy station chief in 1963 in Mexico City, and when Shackley came on board as the uh, head of uh, Western Hemisphere Affairs for the agency, he removed all of the station chiefs all through Latin America uh, and put in his own people. Uh, on the theory that uh, Phil Agee, a former Central Intelligence Agency guy, had just written a book called Inside the Company, in which he divulged a number of the criminal covert operations that the agency had been involved in. And, uh, and Shackley took the position that since Phil Agee had published these kind of secrets about the agency, he might have somehow come into possession of the names of the station chiefs in Latin America, and so that they wanted, Shackley wanted to pull them and put his own people in. And he said, so I'm replacing this, the station chief here with a fellow by the name of Tom Polgar. Uh, and uh, so Polgar comes in to the CIA station in Mexico City, he said, and Polgar comes in to see me, and he says, Joe, he said, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to leave you on here as the deputy 
uh, here in the station. Uh, but I'll tell you what, there's going to be a fellow come in tomorrow morning to see you. He'll be in around 10 o'clock or so. Uh, you'll recognize him, who he is. He said he, he'll want to ask you some questions. And depending on how you answer those questions, uh, that'll have a lot to do with whether I'm going to keep you on here as the deputy. And he may even want to have you go someplace with you, with him and meet some people and answer some questions for them. And so the, if, you, if you would do that, you know, it might make it easier for me to decide. So the next morning, turns out 10 o'clock sharp, through the door, walks Nasser Haro. Nasser Haro was the head of the DFS, which in Mexico is kind of the combined FBI and CIA in Mexico. And he was an extremely conservative, hardcore guy. Uh, comes into the office and he says to, to Joseph uh, Buckholder Smith, he says, Joe, he said, look, at, uh, I got some people I'd like to have you go and see. They, they may have some questions for you. And, uh, you know, I, Polgar told you that uh, we might do this. And he said it was OK with you. And so so Joseph Smith says, OK, all right. So he goes. He goes with Nasser Haro. They leave the office. They go downstairs. And there's this big uh, van with the tinted windows waiting for him and this suburban. And they drive off and they go to the airport in Mexico City, go completely around the security and they get into a private jet, and they take off. And they fly They fly off, and uh, they're flying for a while, then they land, and he realizes he's in Argentina. And uh, he gets out, and they're at the airport, they avoid all the security, and they go and they get into a, a private helicopter, and they fly away. And so they fly and fly and fly up into the northern uh, tip of Argentina, where it comes together with four other countries up there, in this little town, a little town called Salta. And they land on this soccer field in the helicopter, and uh, they get out, and he follows Nasser Haro across this, uh, this soccer field with the dust flying and the helicopter you know, wings and, and, he, and it propellers there, and he goes over and he climbs up the top of this, this embankment, and he gets up to the top of the embankment, and he looks down over the embankment, and he said, I thought I was in Bavaria, he said. And I looked down there, and there was this like, Bavarian town. They're right there in Argentina. He said, and we walk down across the, the top of the hill down into the little town, and Haro brings me to this little Bavarian inn, and we walk in, and here are these six guys sitting at this great big huge oak table uh, up against a fireplace, a big stone fireplace, and over the top of the fireplace is a huge swastika flag. And, and so Smith is kind of freaked out by this whole thing. He said, but they said to him, the guy at the middle of the table says, come on over here, Joe, sit down, sit down. So he sits down on the other side of the table, and the guy in the middle of the table says, Joe, he said, look, there's some questions, you know, we're going to have to put to you here to determine whether or not you're going to be left on as the deputy at the station here in Mexico City. He said, we need to tell you that we have just gotten through creating a major cartel, a cocaine cartel, down in Colombia, in Medellin. And we're going to be smuggling uh, cocaine from here in South America into the United States. And a portion of those, the profits generated from those sales are going to be used to help us fight our war without boundaries against your enemies and ours. And I, I want to make it clear now, I need to get your assurance. If you're going to be left on as the deputy station chief uh, in Mexico City, I need your assurance that you're not going to do anything to interfere with the flow of that cocaine. And Joe turns to me at the table, we're sitting there at the double dinner, and he said, and you know, I, I swear to God, Danny, he said, I don't know what I'd ever done in my whole life that gave them the, the impression that I would go along with something like that. And I said, how about being the deputy CIA station chief in Mexico City for a start? I said, and he, went, he got really kind of muffed by that. He gets up from the table and he says to Dick Billings, he says, gee, I thought he was going to cooperate on this. And Dick looks up at him and says, hey, I just met him. <laughs> you know? And so, so, uh, so Joseph Buckholder Smith comes around the table and looks down at him. He says, well, I just thought, he said, I'd get together with you as I'm getting ready to do this case. I just wanted to let you know. And he sticks his hand out like this to shake my hand. And I reach up and shake. He says, I just wanted to let you know who you're dealing with in this case. Okay, so that's, that's a little start to give you some idea of the surprising scope of what we ran into here in, in dealing with this whole Iran-Contra thing. And so the, the question that comes up is, you know, what, what exactly was it that we discovered 
that we were trying to get put into a container of a complaint that we would have standing to actually complain about and to get a federal court to actually put to a jury to enable us to deal with this scale of a problem. Well, what we discovered, of course, in, in the first instance, was we had discovered this rather extraordinary cabal functioning in the 1980s. That uh, we had stumbled across the weapons shipping that they were going to be doing to the Contras. We discovered who was involved in all of it. Uh, we discovered that uh, George H.W. Bush, George Bush Sr., who was the vice president uh, under Ronald Reagan, starting in 1981, January, for eight years had been the vice president. And in that capacity, he had chaired the 5412 uh, committee, which was uh, the 5412 committee is the committee of the National Security Council that supervises covert operations. So he had come into that position to be filling the position that used to be chaired by Richard Nixon. Back under Eisenhower from 1952 to 1960, it was Richard Nixon that had chaired that 5412 committee and it helped supervise all those operations against Cuba and all the other things. And so George Bush was the guy that was uh, the VP and was, was heading up this covert operation going on. And he was working directly with Theodore Shackley. And Theodore Shackley, as I'd mentioned, had been the head of covert operations for the CIA when George Bush had previously been the director of the Central Intelligence Agency from 1975 to 1977. So the number two guy working with Bush in this whole operation, this cabal, was this guy Theodore Shackley. And I've explained to you who Theodore Shackley was, what the interesting kind of uh, lineage is that he has, and all the different positions that he held, ranging all the way from being the number two guy to, to Reinhard Galen over in, in, in Germany after World War II, all the way to being the CIA station chief in Miami, the CIA station chief in Laos, the CIA station chief in Saigon during the Vietnam War the creator of the Phoenix program, assassination program, et cetera. Uh, and so that Shackley, we discovered this cabal. We've got George George H.W. Bush. We've got Theodore Shackley. We've got uh, the deputy, uh, the, the national security advisor for George W. Bush when he's vice president. This guy, Donald P. Gregg, who is a former CIA guy, who's his national security advisor. We've got uh, Admiral John Poindexter, who is the, the national security advisor for the president, for Ronald Reagan. So there'd be somebody in those shoes anyway. Uh, you know, so they could have someone to talk to about these covert operations other than Reagan. Uh, and we discovered that there was a whole cabal of these people. Major General uh, Richard Secord, U.S. Uh, Air Force Major General, former uh, uh, former uh, deputy to the comptroller of the military supplies to the Middle East. Uh, there was uh, Tom Kleins, uh, the deputy to Theodore Shackley. Uh, there were a, a whole bunch of these people that we've talked about in the past. We've uncovered this cabal of people that are involved in smuggling these weapons down to the Contras, even though the United States Congress has expressly prohibited it. And so that we, we had come across this group and we realized that in the administration of Ronald Reagan and then later George Bush, H.W. Bush, there was this other group of guys that were in there that was Richard Cheney and Paul Wolfowitz and uh, Richard Pearl and Elliot Abrams and uh, David Addington and Douglas Fife and uh, Irving Kristol. There's a whole group of these people. There are a whole bunch of these extreme right wing reactionary people that are all involved in the, in the Reagan-Bush administration. And so we had, we had discovered the existence of this group, but, and we realized that in 1980, the way that they had come to power is that they had launched a covert political operation against Jimmy Carter. They had, they had engaged in this October surprise, this agreement, with the Hezbollah to hold our American hostages, our 52 hostages, till after the election. But over and above that, it turns out, they had secretly smuggled into the United States millions and millions of dollars from an offshore bank in Australia, the Nugan Hand Bank, where they were actually banking portions of the skim they were taking off the heroin sales with Vang Pao in Southeast Asia. They were putting them into the Nugan Hand Bank. So they took monies from that bank and from two South African banks 
and they smuggled it into the United States, and they targeted the members of the United States Senate, whom they viewed to be their enemies. And so they went after Frank Church from Idaho, who had chaired the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Abuse that had revealed all of the terrible things that the CIA was doing. They went after him. They went after Senator Dick Clark from Iowa, who'd stopped them from engaging in covert operations in Angola and Africa. They went, uh, they went after, of course, Jimmy Carter. They went after Birch Bayh from Indiana. They went after Alan Cranston from California. And they went after George McGovern. They had designated these guys as on a hit list, that they were actually smuggling covert drug money in that they were using to fund assassination programs in Southeast Asia. They brought it actually into the United States and infected the entire electoral system by bringing this, this money in and targeting these guys for removal. And as we started to investigate these people more deeply, we came to realize that these people dated all the way back into 1959 Cuba. Uh, and, and we realized that they had all been involved with Richard Nixon and the mafia uh, and, the, and the fascist governor of, uh, of a president of Cuba, you know, and, uh, uh, Batista. And they were business partners, actually, with them, and that they had this deep covert operation going on out of Cuba, which was that after World War II, there was a whole process set up of smuggling uh, the Southeast Asian heroin out of the Golden Triangle, and that it was being smuggled by, by uh, military officials, uh, Jack Singlaub and others that were involved in it, and they were smuggling the, the opium out, and it was being transformed into heroin by the Corsican Mafia and smuggled into Cuba. And Cuba was acting as the base from which heroin was being sold up into the United States by a group called the Sea Supply Corporation. That's S period, E period, A period, the Sea Supply Corporation, the president and director of which was a fellow by the name of Paul Helliwell, full-time employee of the Central Intelligence Agency, was actually you know, bringing the heroin in, having it moved by Santo Traficante and the Mafia up into the United States, and some of the profits were being used to purchase military equipment, weapons, guns, explosives, etc., for the Kuomintang which were the nationalist Chinese in China who were opposing uh, Mao Zedong. And uh, this was all being done covertly. And so Cuba became, had become the center point right offshore, off the United States, to, to smuggle the heroin in and to fund, secretly fund, the Kuomintang over in Southeast Asia. And that this deep uh, covert operation was going on in Cuba uh, back in, as of 1959, when uh, Fidel Castro and Raul Castro and Che Guevara and the others led the revolution and overthrew Batista. And this is what had actually triggered the kind of semi-insane response that Richard Nixon had had when the Batista government was ousted from power uh, back on New Year's Eve in 1959. And uh, they all went nuts about this. And so Richard Nixon, who was then the vice president, under Eisenhower and the chair of the 5412 committee organized a major covert operation to attempt to overthrow the new revolutionary government in Cuba. And it, they, weren't, they weren't going to accept any kind of conditions. They, the, the Cuban government reached out to them, the new revolutionary government, asking them for assistance and asking to be friends. And the, the Eisenhower-Nixon administration set the absolute condition that Cuba had to renounce any relations with the Soviet Union or with China as a condition for the United States recognizing them. And if they refused to do that, the United States would to consider them to be enemies. And so that's what happened. That's how Richard Nixon basically did that, because Richard Nixon was deeply involved with those mafia people that were involved in the smuggling of the heroin, which was a full-scale CIA covert operation which was a key element in funding our covert operations in Southeast Asia against Mao. And so that's why Cuba was so sensitive. And that's why Nixon made it such a top priority to try to overthrow that government. And what we discovered is that this cabal that we had uncovered in the 80s dated all the way back into that, that earlier cabal. 
that whole group of people that were that were uh, functioning in the covert operations uh, in 1959 and 1960 with Richard Nixon to try to overthrow the Cuban government. There was Nixon and Howard Hughes and Bob Mayhew and Johnny Roselli and, and Sam Giancana and Trafficanti and uh, all these people that we that I've talked with you about uh, in the past classes. And these people were all deeply aligned with Alan Dulles, the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, Bill Harvey, uh, James Angleton, uh, Richard Bissell, uh, Robert Crowley, Bill Corson, there were a whole bunch of people that were in the CIA station down in Miami that were all deeply involved and in, in dedicatedly trying to overthrow that government down there. And so that, that's why the issue around Cuba becomes so incredibly central to trying to understand what was going on that we had walked on top of here. Uh, because the, the people that were deeply involved in attempting to smuggle the weapons through the Contras in, in Central America were a lot of the Miami-based anti-Castro Cubans who had, because of their long history in working with Richard Nixon and the Central Intelligence Agency in the efforts from 1959 to 1965 to try to overthrow the, the Castro government in Cuba, had become assassins and uh, special covert operations operatives. And so that they were deeply involved, as it turns out, in the covert operation that we uh, had uncovered in 1984 when we walked on top of these guys trying to smuggle these weapons to the Contras in direct violation of the Boland Amendment. So we had seen now that the, that the cabal that we had discovered in the 80s tracked all the way back into this earlier cabal of people in the 1960s. But what we discovered upon deeper analysis of this uh, is that even though that was about as far back as we could go under the Federal Racketeering Act, the RICO Act that allows you to go back. If you can, if you can identify a, a, uh, an ongoing racketeer-influenced corrupt organization and can show that they committed two overt acts that are listed as among the predicate acts of the RICO Act, if you could show that they committed two or more acts within a given 10-year period, you could go back to the previous 10-year period if you could prove that they engaged in two overt acts or predicate acts during that 10-year period. So we tracked this thing all the way back into 1959, into Cuba, so that we could gather all of these people together and tell the jury and tell the, uh, the American people who these people were, how long they had been acting. And you can see that in your book, The Shadow Government. Uh, you, you see the whole history of these people. But what we discovered was that this cabal from the 60s uh, was in fact predated by an earlier cabal back in the 1950s. And that this, this is the whole issue of Galen, this thing I pointed out to you, that right in the concluding months of World War II, we learned that Galen, uh, Reinhard Galen, the head of the Nazi Third Reich anti-Soviet and anti-Eastern Bloc intelligence, had turned himself in to the United States, 101st Counterintelligence Corps and had revealed who he was and said, now look, now that, the, now that World War II is over, you guys are going to have to confront Russia and the Soviets. And so we'll join with you. If you will take me and the men that I designate off the Nuremberg war crime tribunal lists, we will work directly with you and for you as the source of intelligence against the Soviets. And that we established, I say we, uh, the, the actual intelligence community of the United States established this alliance with Reinhard Galen. Uh, and as I, as I told you, that Galen was, was put into power in the new country of West Germany, the Western half that was governed by the Allies, and the Soviets then had Eastern Germany. But in West Germany, they set up a West German intelligence service, and Reinhard Galen was made the head of it. And he continued for 26 years to be the chief source of anti-Soviet intelligence primarily for the Allied nations in his Galen org. Okay? And Theodore Shackley, as I pointed out to you, worked directly with him. He was assigned in, out of the first class of people from the Central Intelligence Agency to go and work directly under Galen in Berlin. And he was there all the way from 1948 or 49, all the way through until 1962, when he was brought out of Berlin and became the station chief for the CIA in Miami. 
Now, this is, this is the group that we discovered was even deeper in uh, this group from the 50s, the people that worked with Reinhard Galen, the people that have been trained at the uh, Anti-Communist Special Warfare Training Academy uh, at Oberammergau by Otto Skorzeny, uh, the, the people that had helped uh, establish the National Security Act of 1947, uh, has set up the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, uh, that worked now dur all during this period of the 50s with Paul Heliwell and the mafia smuggling in the heroin to help fund the operations in Southeast Asia, that we discovered that this, this cabal that we had uncovered in the 1980s actually had predecessors back into the 60s and actually back into the 50s from the end of World War II. But... As we, as we investigated it more deeply, we discovered that that particular group of people that had become so instantaneously friendly with the, with the fascists, with the Nazis, uh, at the end of World War II, involved in this rabid kind of uh, anti-communist uh, crusade around the world, as it turns out, they had been favorable to the Nazis before World War II that there was this whole group of people inside the United States kind of ruling classes that had been extremely sympathetic uh, to the cause of Adolf Hitler, that they viewed Hitler as being the, the, uh, the uh, major uh, blockage against Bolshevism, that he would be the bulwark against Bolshevism in Europe. And so the, they got into funding this guy. And the, one of the key people that we discovered that was involved in this was this fellow by the name of George Herbert Walker. George Herbert Walker, who was in fact the father, uh, or the grandfather, or George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, had been the CEO and the head of uh, the, uh, the W.A. Harriman uh, and Company investment house uh, in the late 19... 19, early 1920s, late 1919, 18, or 1919, he had been there as the CEO of Brown Brothers, and that Brown Brothers Harriman uh, had become a major focal point for extraordinarily wealthy people uh, and handled a lot of their investments. And their lawyers for the, the clients of Brown Brothers Harriman were, were a group called Sullivan and Cromwell. And Sullivan and Cromwell had lawyers in it, that one of whom was Alan Dulles, and the other was his brother, John Foster Dulles. And John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles inside Sullivan and Cromwell had become the lawyers functioning for Brown Brothers Harriman, the CEO of which was George Herbert Walker. And that they had been involved uh, for years in trying to instigate foreign military expeditionary forces in different parts of the world to try to put down any of the peasantry that attempted to rise up and to assert any type of control over their natural resources. And their, their, whether it's United Fruit or the major standard oil companies, whatever the major corporations were that were attempting to expropriate uh, natural resources from around the world were being represented, their funding operations were being represented by Brown Brothers Harriman, and their lawyers were Sullivan and Cromwell, the, the Dulles brothers. And so we discover that that entire group of people uh, was in operation from 1920 all the way through up to 1924 to 1934. And it turns out that George Herbert Walker stepped down as the CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman in 1924 and replaced himself with his son-in-law, Prescott Bush. Prescott Bush, who was the father of George Herbert Walker Bush and the grandfather of George W. Bush, that he became the new CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman, and George Herbert Walker went over and established a, uh, a bank called the Union Banking Corporation in New York City, which had a subsidiary in uh, Holland, uh, this Bank voor Handel. Uh, this bank was a, a bank in the, all of these super wealthy people that were working with Brown Brothers Harriman, who were the clients of Sullivan and Cromwell, et cetera, what they did is they ended up depositing millions and millions of dollars into the, uh, into the Union Banking Corporation, and they put it offshore in the Netherlands, and it was used to fund the rise of Adolf Hitler to power in Germany. And so this group of people 
it had in fact translated its, its mere uh, moral support for Hitler in his being the potential bulwark against Bolshevism in Europe into being some of the principal funders of the, of the rise of, of Nazism in, uh, in uh, state-based capitalism in, in uh, Germany. And they, they became a major power in the United States. And they were, in fact, responsible for resisting any efforts on the part of the leadership in the United States to prepare for war against Germany. So even when Germany in 1939 invaded Poland and then took the Sudetenland back and then went into Austria, Hungary, they, they, they were marching throughout Europe. They were marching down the streets under the Champs-Élysées in France, invading France and overthrowing. They were firebombing England and the United States wasn't doing anything. And it was because of these guys these people and their power and influence inside the United States were, was so dominant that they would not allow the United States to go to war against Germany. In fact, when Roosevelt uh, was elected in 1932, these people all gathered together and worked with others to organize a military overthrow of the United States government to oust Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, this was testified about at great length behind closed doors to a special committee of the United States Congress called the McCormick Dickstein Committee uh, on November 20th of 1934. There was a major set of testimony. They had several witnesses that came in and testified about this whole endeavor to, uh, to put together this operation. But almost all the major media, Henry Luce and Time Magazine and Life Magazine, the New York Times, all the major media poo-pooed these allegations and covered for these people who had actually tried to do this. They pushed it off as being a hoax, uh, that it was a, uh, you know, somebody's pipe dreams, but the fact is there were major people that were immediately involved in this that testified. And, uh, and one of the major issues that they were upset about was the fact that Roosevelt had taken the country off the gold standard. And that these people were adamant in insisting upon the maintenance of the gold standard. And it turns out that that entire group that we're talking about from 1920 to 1934 are funding the rise of Hitler in Germany uh, were caught, actually, uh, after these, this testimony came out, and they were actually ordered to stop funding Hitler. Now, that, but that wasn't until 1939. So they continued funding Hitler all the way from 1924 basically, all the way through almost to 1939. Uh, and then when Congress ordered them to stop doing that, they stopped, but nothing was ever done to them. And no, none of the funds were taken back from them that they'd made it in profits in selling war machinery and stuff to Germany, which they did. And, uh, and parenthetically, one of the other major sources of military equipment for the Nazis uh, in the, the Third Reich the rise to power of them was a fellow by the name of Abdul Aziz. Abdul Aziz was the patriarch of the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia. It had been created in 1922 by a special commission that was chaired by Winston Churchill. Uh, he was the, the Secretary of Colonial Affairs for the UK. He chaired this 22 person commission that actually crafted the boundaries for all the Middle Eastern countries after the end of World War I, and designated Abdul Aziz to be the patriarch, to be in charge of Saudi Arabia. He's the one that handpicked the, the royal family uh, in Kuwait. He's the one that picked the, the, the major uh, uh, authoritarian uh, governors, the royalist uh, classes in the various countries. Uh, and uh, this, this, uh, this whole set of activity was undertaken at the end of World War I to divide the whole world up into this way that would be beneficial for the major financial interests in the Western culture. Except that the elements that were here in the United States, part of that culture that were funding, funding uh, Hitler, uh, Hitler got so carried away about all this stuff that when he ended up, uh, ended up taking over all of Europe, it was firebombing London, uh, there was, you, the United States was paralyzed. The leadership in the United States was paralyzed about being able to do anything to stop him. 
And so what happened is Franklin Roosevelt uh, undertook a whole series of steps, which were to confront Japan and to cut off uh, supplies of, of metals and stuff to Japan, uh, a whole series of embargoes that he imposed through executive orders against Japan. And then Franklin Roosevelt basically uh, lured the Japanese in to, after irritating them and, and infuriating them with his policies for a number of years, basically lured them in to, into a Pearl Harbor. And, and when the Japanese uh, bit on the bait and they attacked the United States to try to take back uh, the, the Hawaiian Islands, uh, the United States Congress declared war on Japan. Now, it's extremely important to remember, and most of you wouldn't have ever believed it, but the United States never did declare war on Germany. Germany declared war on the United States after we declared war on Japan for attacking us. But that's how, that's how Roosevelt managed to get us to, to join in against Hitler in the face of all of these major uh, proto-fascist uh, elements in the United States. But it, but it turns out that that group, that it was from 1920 to 1939 supporting Hitler, had predecessors. They were mainly involved with the, the, the Harriman, Brown Brothers people that were, were existing all the way from 1900, had been involved in instigating foreign military expeditionary forces around the world uh, and mounting them themselves, financing some of them themselves privately. So that what we discovered is that there was a, a long history uh, that dates all the way back uh, into before World War I of this element inside the United States that has been basically countering the fundamental concepts of democratic uh, constitutional government. They have been perceiving themselves as ones in positions of authority and power to determine what the foreign policy activities of our country are going to be. And it turns out that this, this dates all the way back into the very founding of our country. And that's what, that is what is so radical about what it is that we discovered here. Because, because we'd always thought that, oh, you could just take these people and expose them for being so un-American, so anti-democratic, so completely authoritarian and unilateral in their activity, and everybody would just go, oh, that's absolutely horrible, and they'd put them in jail, and it'd be all set. But it turns out, surprisingly, that didn't happen. Because it turns out that behind closed doors, it's been known by all of the major power brokers in the country that in fact, there has always been this element inside our country. That when we, when we established our constitution from 1789 to 17, when we ratified the full constitution in 1789 and ratified the Bill of Rights in 1791, that very period, I want you to focus on this, from 1789 to 1791, that period of the finalization of our United States Constitution, in which we basically enshrined in the document the basic concepts of natural law, that people are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain fundamental rights, that these rights abide over and against the state, no matter how badly the state wants to violate them. You as a matter of your human dignity have these rights. That entire thesis had been inculcated into the United States Constitution because the founding fathers believed in a certain type of natural law philosophy, basically a, a Scottish Enlightenment a theory of, of uh, natural rights. Uh, and so that because we succeeded in our revolution against the royalists and the ecclesiastical uh, elites of Europe, that we succeeded in our revolution in throwing them off and in, in inculcating into our constitution a, a set of uh, natural law values that promoted individual rights and democracy as a, as a form of government. But in Europe, they lost their revolution. From 1789 to 1791, there was a major rising up in France uh, of the peasantry against the royalists and against the ecclesial forces, but they basically lost. In my judgment, probably one of the major reasons was that they had no particular organizing principle. They didn't have any kind of, kind of coordinating and unifying ethos. They were just really PO'd at the royalists and the ecclesial forces, and so they got up and they ran around and they killed a bunch of them, but they didn't have any kind of positive organizing thesis. 
And in fact, what happened that after the French Revolution failed is the royalists and the ecclesial forces in Europe got together and said, we just missed that one. You know, we've got to make sure not to allow the people of Europe to catch wind of this natural law tradition that has taken seed over in the colonies and has generated an entire constitutional form of government with democracy at its base. If we're going to survive as the ruling elite in Europe, we have to develop a complete alternative uh, ethos or mode of ethical reasoning to replace natural law. And so what they did is they struggled for about 30 years, from 1791 to about 17, or until 1821. And in, that, in that, that whole set of analysis that went on during that time, they ended up formulating in Europe a theory of government that was basically predicated upon a materialist, non-spiritual, a materialist dialectic, is that our human family is incapable of ascertaining truth is incapable of ascertaining any kind of unitive phenomenon that will act as a referent for what kind of human conduct is harmonious or disharmonious to the natural order of things. That's, that's an impossibility, they asserted. And so therefore, all you have is your own particular thesis about what reality is, or truth is, or right is. And you can postulate your thesis, but by definition, someone is going to give rise to an antithesis, and they're going to clash to join together to form a synthesis that'll become its new operating thesis, et cetera. And what you see what this did is it enshrined the value of struggle and confrontation between a thesis and an antithesis. And of course, they, in being in charge, the royalists and the ecclesial forces, they asserted themselves as the thesis. And that the peasantry that was trying to resist them until such time as they could formulate some kind of a coherent antithesis to them, they were going to justify their continued vanquishing of these people uh, as, the, as the primary governing thesis in Western civilization. And that became the thesis of Caucasian, nation-state-based capitalist imperialism that actually characterized the European culture throughout the entire last part of the 19th century. The whole concept of the white man's burden, the whole concept of manifest destiny to overthrow the, the aboriginal people in our country, the whole concept of the divine right that they thought they had, the Brits, for example, to go into India and take over to, to show all these poor little brown people how to live. You know, that, that entire concept of the, the Caucasian-based theory of, of state capitalism, capitalism that was supported and sustained by the, by the government, that supported and subsidized major business people through tax money to help subsidize them, and then let them keep the profits for themselves. This whole mechanism was set up in Europe as the European theory of governing. Uh, and so it, it, the fact that I'm driving at here is that from that very period of time, when that theory of government arose in, in Europe that justified struggle between an elite, privileged, Caucasian aristocracy and versus the peasantry, that that whole theory of government represented an antithetical form of a worldview to the natural law worldview that was our constitutional heritage. And so that right from the very beginning, there were people in the United States that did not believe in the natural law theory, did not believe that the peasantry had a right to participate in making decisions for ourselves, that these people believed they had the right to make these decisions. And they organized around a series of issues, one of the major ones of which was the creation of a major central bank, a major federal bank. And Alexander Hamilton uh, was their lawyer. And there was a whole push right at the very beginning of the country to set up a major federal bank so that it could give loans to and subsidize a major business. And there was this entire theory of sustaining, creating and sustaining a governing elite inside the United States, a business elite, which in fact was almost hereditary. That all these business uh, elites married into each other's families. They all set up private schools for their kids to go to. You know, and they all ended up going to Exeter and Andover and Choate and Harvard and Yale. And there was a, there was a whole kind of elite theory uh, of, of their right to govern here in the United States. 
And what we, what we discovered is that uh, we had run into the present manifestation of that when we stumbled across this illegal weapons supply operations to the Contras. That what this really represented was a major covert effort on the part of the ruling elite that were in positions of governing the Central Intelligence Agency and in foisting their, you know, economic advantage onto other countries around the world through covert operations, we had walked right on top of that. So this wasn't a, a thing where it was just a particular bad piece of fruit that could be just plucked off the tree and buried. It turns out that this was the very trunk of the tree itself. This was the actual roots of the tree that we had basically walked right on top of here. And so our, our job was to try to fit this into the statutory uh, prohibitions of the Federal Racketeering Influence Corrupt Organization Act. And, uh, and it turns out it was a perfect fit. Uh, and, uh, and we actually got G. Robert Blakey, who was the actual author of the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organization Act for the Senate Judiciary Committee. He wrote a special amicus brief saying this was the most effectively pleaded RICO case that he had ever seen. So we, we locked right down on this thing and we went after them. We, we set it forth in a, in a RICO complaint. We filed it on the 29th of May of 1986. And then I come back to Washington and this thing starts to happen. I get the call from James Lawrence King. I discovered that the, the basic Central Intelligence Agency and the United States Justice Department people have all organized themselves to protect these guys, to try to shut us off. Uh, and what they, so as, as we began trying to file discovery depositions against these defendants, they just fat, flat out defied us. They just flat wouldn't respond at all. And we would file motions with Judge James Lawrence King asking him to compel them to comply with the regular civil rules of discovery, and he would just ignore us. And we, we just kept going on that way. So what I did is, uh, after, after talking with, with Dick Billings and uh, getting to meet uh, Joseph Buckholzer-Smith and, and hearing the story about what the scale of this group was that we were really coping with here, I went over to see Tip O'Neill in Washington. He was the Speaker of the House, and I went over to see him, and I brought him a copy of our complaint, and I gave it to him, and I explained to him what this whole thing was that was going on, and he said to me, he said, uh, look, Dan, he said, you know, uh, we're, we're in control, the Democrats are in control of the House of Representatives right now, uh, so we could bring this evidence to the Judiciary Committee with Peter Rodino, and we could put it in front of him, and we could return articles of impeachment against Reagan and Bush and Meese and Elliot Abrams and, and Bill Casey and all these people. He said, but the, the trial would have, excuse me, the trial would have to be held in the Senate, and the Republicans still control the Senate. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't vote for it. I mean, just flat out raw telling me that no matter what the evidence was, that uh, as long as the opposing party held the Senate, they wouldn't vote for it. And he said, so we'll have to wait until to see if we're going to recover and recover control of the Senate in the fall of 1986 here. Well, this is like in May of, of 86, and I'm talking to Pip O'Neill. But he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, here's, here's what we'll do. Uh, I'll agree that we'll set up a special hearing uh, on this as soon as we win, if we win in the fall. What he's saying basically is, will you get all, everybody you know to help us win? Uh, you know, if, if you want me to do something for you, you help us win, right? This is Washington, D.C., after all. And, uh, and so uh, he said, but here's what you do. He said, uh, you go up and see Claiborne Pell. Claiborne Pell, who is the Democratic senator from Rhode Island, and since the Democrats are in the minority right now, he's the ranking member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But Warren Rudman is the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, a Republican from New Hampshire. But you go up and see, you go up and see Claiborne Pell, and you tell him what you've got. I'll call ahead and let him know you're coming and tell him to take your, take your visit. So you go up and talk to him and tell him what you want to do. Uh, and he said, look, uh, you ask him, you say you want to get him to establish that the Democrats win. You want him to establish a special select committee to investigate all these charges here that you're making. He said, and when he asks you, and he will, who do you think should chair this committee? You tell him John Kerry. You tell him John Kerry. He loves John Kerry. You know, we all make fun. Maybe John Kerry is his illegitimate son. 
He said, you know, we all, he loves him so much, and he wants him to be president of the United States. So you tell him John Kerry is the guy you want to chair this, and he'll do this. So I go upstairs, uh, you go over to the Hart uh, Central Office building, and I go upstairs, and I arrive, and I tell him who I am, and sure enough, Pip O'Neill has already called, and so I go on in, and I sit down with, uh, with uh, Claiborne Pell, and I tell him what I want, and explain to him, I give him a copy of the complaint, et cetera, uh, and, and, I, and then he says to me, who, who do you think should uh, chair this? And I said, I was thinking John Kerry. John Kerry, that's a terrific idea. He says, that's a great idea. Good, we'll do that. He says, but we have to win first. So you, know, you talk to everybody that you know and blah, blah, and get them to help us. So, so uh, that, that whole thing is, is underway. And uh, that we're, we're spending the entire summer trying to, get, trying to get these bad guys to respond to our subpoenas. But they won't, right? And so what we do is we start taking depositions of our own clients and start taking depositions of our own witnesses, almost unheard of, that you would actually put your own witnesses out for them to cross-examine. So, so what, we, what we did is we ended up uh, starting to take the depositions of our own witnesses just to make clear to the other side how much evidence we actually had against them and to make it clear to Judge King how much evidence that we had against them. And so we, for example, took the deposition of Jack Terrell, Jack Terrell was a guy that worked with Tom Posey in the Civilian Military Assistance Group down in, in uh, Alabama. And he came on under oath and told us that he'd been involved in smuggling the weapons down. He told all about flying them out of Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood Airport, flying them down to Ilopango, putting them on the big planes and flying them to John Hull's ranch. And he gave us all the details. Fill it right, right out of the chute, the first one of our first depositions. He laid the whole thing out and told about how he knew about this to his own firsthand knowledge because he was personally involved in the whole thing. And then he told us that, that uh, because he got to meet all of these different people, John Hull and the other people on the, on the ranch down there, that uh, he was asked to come to a meeting with John Hull and Rene Corvo and uh, the Villa Verde brothers and about eight or ten other guys. They brought him to the meeting, and, uh, and Rene Corvo gets up in front of all of them and says, we're the ones that put the bomb under Eden Pastora uh, over at Lepanka. But it didn't get him, didn't kill him. So we need someone else to kill him. We want you to kill him because you're an American guy. You may be able to get close to him. So he tells us under oath in the deposition that these people who are all named defendants, you know, one of them got up and expressly admitted having done this, this criminal act, try to kill Pastora, and that these guys were the guys that did it with him. And they all sat right there in his hearing and said nothing, which is a, a number one exception to the hearsay rule, so that uh, so that if if in fact if in fact someone says you know it's an admission of course if a person if a person is a is a defendant and they admit directly that they've committed the offense you know that's a direct admission so the statements of Rene Corvo were direct admission on his part and they were hearsay evidence uh, as to somebody else but if they're sitting in the presence of the of the statement and it's incriminating them, and they say nothing to contradict it, it is an exception to the hearsay rule. That, that evidence is directly admissible against every single one of them. So we had that done right in our first uh, deposition, just about. And then we took the deposition of a fellow named Car Carlos Rojas Chinchilla. He's the fellow I mentioned in passing that was hanging out in the bar, and the guy came into the bar and told him, oh, gee, you know, uh, I'm out on John Hull's ranch, and we've been involved, and uh, we're trying to, these guys are all trying to kill uh, Tams, uh, the ambassador to the United States, you know, uh, for, to Costa Rica, uh, Louis Tams, and we're, they're all the guys that tried to kill Eden Pastora at Lepanka. And so we bring, we bring on this guy, Carlos Chinchilla, to tell the entire thing about all of that happening. And then we actually subpoenaed the driver of John Hull, who testified under oath that he had driven John Hull to a meeting with a guy whom he picked out of, of uh, seven, nine actually, nine different photographs that we had of different people. He picked this guy out as the guy that John Hull went and met with and gave an envelope full of what looked like cash. And this was this guy, Per Anker Hansen. Uh, that, that it turns out we, we called to the, state, to the deposition uh, the Attorney General of Costa Rica, 
The Attorney General of Costa Rica laid out the full details of all of their investigation. All of their expert witnesses brought in copies of the originals of their investigative reports and laid out the reason why they were indicting John Hall, Rene Corvo, uh, the Villaverde brothers, and these other guys for the, the, for the murder of the people at La Penca. So the Costa Rican Attorney General testified under oath, and we listed as potential witnesses every single one of the experts, every single one of their investigators who put on the witness list to call at the trial to prove that this guy, Pederanka Hansen, is the guy that did the killing. And now we had the driver of John Hall telling us under oath that he drove John Hall to a meeting with this very guy that he picked out of this lineup. Okay? And then we, we called uh, his secretary, John Hall's secretary, and she testified that on the very same date that the driver said he drove John Hull to meet with this guy and hand him this envelope, that John Hull came and had her take out $50,000 in cash from the bank and put it in an envelope and give it to him. And so that we, we had, and then we had an eyewitness that testified that 22 days before the bombing at La Penca, this eyewitness saw John Hull and this guy, Imak Galil, who this guy picked out of nine different photographs of different people, picked him out as well, saying that's the guy right there. And it turns out that's the guy that the Costa Rican uh, attorney general uh, indicted for the murders. Okay, so we had all of that evidence on the record. Okay, and they kept fighting us off and refusing to, to come to our depositions. We kept filing motions with Judge King, trying to order them to comply with the, the discovery rules, and he wouldn't do anything. And then finally, as it turns out, October 5th, now this was in May of 1986. Now in, in October, on October 5th of 1986, we're like later, we're June, July, August, September, October, we're like uh, four months later. And I'm sitting down in uh, the house of John Mattis, who is the chief federal public defender down in Miami in the Southern District. I'm at his house on a Friday evening, October 5th of, of, of 86, and we're getting set to watch Miami Vice. Right? We're in Miami. That's cool. So we're kicked back and we're getting ready to watch Miami Vice, right? And the telephone rings. So he gets up and goes to the phone. And he says, Danny, it's, uh, it is uh, the foreign minister of uh, Nicaragua, uh, Father Descoto, you know, looking for you. And I said, Oh, you know, I get calls from Descoto. No, I didn't say that. I said, uh, No, I, so I say, Far out, you know. So I go over. I say, Hello, Father Descoto. And he starts telling me about how uh, they've, a plane has just been shot down over Nicaragua, a big C 123. The pilot and the co pilot have been killed, Cooper and Sawyer. Uh, but there's this uh, third guy that was on it, was a kicker, was kicking stuff out the back door of the, of the C-123, these supplies to the Contras uh, by the name of Eugene Hassenfuss. And he's been arrested by the Sandinista government. And he's in custody now, but he's hysterical. Uh, and he thinks he's going to spend his entire rest of his life in a dungeon down in, in Mexico somewhere. Uh, and he, uh, he, we were having a hard time getting him to talk. Would you have Father Bill Davis? Uh, your invest one of your investigators, who is the director of the National Office of Social Ministry for the United States Jesuit headquarters, would you have him come down and uh, and assure Hassenfuss that if he will cooperate with us, we have nothing against him, but we need to get his evidence that if he will cooperate with us, that uh, Father Davis and I may be able to work out some kind of a, uh, a, a an easy way to uh, let him go. And so I call Father Bill Davis, and Bill Davis uh, suits up and goes down and goes in to talk with Gene Hassenfuss. So he gets Gene talking. He says, look, at, uh, we know everything anyhow, Gene. And he starts telling Hassenfuss about all the stuff that we know. we got end user certificates. we got tail numbers on the airplanes. We've got full uh, printouts of the, of the invoices of the weapons. We know everything that's going on. So he says, well, gee, you know, uh, you know what point is it in me not admitting it? And so Bill says, here, come on out, and we'll put you on tape. So they bring him out, and they swear him under oath, and they set up video cameras, and he starts talking, telling everything about all the details about Ilopango and how they ship the stuff around and how they've got cocaine flying back and forth on this thing. And he goes into great detail on this. And it turns out there's a young kind of enterprising UPI uh, reporter uh, down there who hears all of this. And when, when Hassenfuss identifies where the safe house is, out of which Sawyer and, uh, and uh, he were flying, Cooper and Sawyer and he were flying, 
they, they fly, they go to, he goes to the house, right? Uh, and it turns out that they've got, they have found in the wallet of Sawyer, the, the pilot of the plane, they find the private unlisted home telephone number of Bill Casey, who was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the Republican National Presidential Campaign chairman, right? And they find his number there. And the UPI guy uh, goes to where the safe house is that Hassenfuss has identified, goes into the house, searches around, gets the telephone number off the phone, and then goes to the phone company and gets the phone records. And it turns out that on the phone records, there are the private unlisted home telephone numbers of 11 of our 26 defendants. And this hits the press, bang, like that. You know, the next day on October 8th or 9th, it's, it's all the press around the country. And uh, everybody starts mumbling, whoa, what is this? Wasn't, isn't there someone around town talking about this somewhere? That didn't some group sue somebody or something? There were all kinds of rumors around about what we were doing. And so, uh, and so this uh, a group, a group of guys uh, uh, get, all, get all organized, uh, Wilson, Brian Wilson and a group of the guys all gather together and they get onto the steps of the, of the House of Representatives. They get on the steps and there are about 500 of them. They're sitting on the steps chanting and chanting, demanding to have a special set of hearings to look into what these revelations are that have all been made the front pages now, right, of Eugene Hassenfuss. But of course, it's now October 10th or so, and the election is coming up on November 4th of 1986. And so everybody's gone, right? They're all gone home campaigning. And so they get on the steps and they start demonstrating. And all the television camera people come out and, you know, they're fasting and going to starve themselves to death and all the stuff that people do. Uh, and so they were doing all of these things. Uh, and so it turns out that uh, 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 the, guy, the guy who chaired, who chairs the, uh, the subcommittee on uh, Western Hemisphere Affairs, Mike Barnes, uh, gets really embarrassed by this. Uh, it's not looking good, you know, humiliating all the Democrats that are in charge on the House side, right? And so he goes out on the steps and has one of these palsy meetings with Brian Wilson and stuff and says, look at, look at, look at, what, what, is it, what can we do to help you leave so you're not embarrassing us right toward the election time here? And Wilson says, look, you need to have a special set of hearings. You're, you chair the, the House subcommittee of the Foreign Affairs Committee on Western Hemisphere Affairs. You need to convene a special committee and you call Danny Sheehan and have him testify to you about everything he knows about what's going on down there. And do it right before the election and smash these people. And Mike Barnes goes, oh, I don't know about that. And he, he goes back to his office. He calls me and he says, hello, Mr. Sheehan. Uh, this is Mike Barnes. Uh, I chair the, uh, the subcommittee of the, and I said, I know, I know who you are. And he said, look, uh, Brian Wilson and these other people are out on the steps and they've been organizing and they're embarrassing the Democratic Party. We're right on the eve of an election here. Uh, and he keeps saying that he, we have to have a special hearing and have you come and testify. You don't really want to do that. You know? He said, yeah, we're right on the eve of the election. The Democrats are all at home. And you don't want to do this, do you? And I said, I definitely want to do this. <laughs> yeah, well, no, he says, you don't really want to do this. Uh, this is kind of, you know, it's right before the election. And I said, no, I heard you, but I do want to do it. In fact, uh, if you don't let us do it, I'll tell them that you asked me, and I said I wanted to, and you wouldn't do it. <laughs> and so he goes, rah, 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 peg a loomer. So anyway, he, sch he schedules a, a set of hearings for so the 15th of October. 15th of October, we're now like two weeks out from the election, right? And so I come in front of the, the special select committee uh, in the House of Representatives, and they've pulled people in out of the backwaters and have gotten them to come into, into Washington to sit on the hearing, right? So we're in there, all the C-SPAN cameras are on, you know, it's a big, big hoodoo going on here, right? Because it's on all the front pages of the papers and everybody's going crazy. So we're in there. And so I asked him to call uh, Robert White, who is the former ambassador to El Salvador uh, under the Carter administration, to call him too, to explain how it's completely impossible for these kind of flights that are going on, going down into Ilopango, down in El Salvador, and then transshipping all the weapons over into, into uh, Costa Rica. It's impossible for that to be going on without the American government knowing about it. You, 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 it's impossible. And so they call Robert White first, and he gets up and testifies about the whole thing. He said, I don't have any personal knowledge of this going on, but if it is going on, then it has to be, the government has to know about it. So then I get called, and I start 
testifying about what the details are, who these people are and all that. I get into, right, just started getting into the meat of this thing. And Henry Hyde from Illinois, who's on the committee, leaps to his feet. He says, this is outrageous. He said, turn off those C-SPAN cameras. This is all national security information. He says, you're revealing national security information. Besides, your complaint is under seal, you know, and you're in contempt for talking about this to anybody. I said, I'm actually under subpoena. I said, you know, from the United States Congress to tell them about this. You know, they think that I'm supposed to not tell them when they ask me to tell them about this. And, and he said, no, no, turn off the C-SPAN cameras. We're going to get all the public out of here, all the media out of here. We're going to have a closed door session and you're going to give us the names of all your sources. And I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm not going to do anything like that. He said, you're not. And I said, absolutely not. I said, if I gave you the name of the sources, I said, they'd be dead within a week. I said, because you and this guy over here, Bill McCollum from the 5th District in Florida, are criminals, both of you. You should be in federal prison. You shouldn't be here asking me for my sources. You should be in federal prison. We've got direct testimony of you sitting with Rob Owen talking about the weapon shipments that are going on in complete defiance of the Bolton Amendment. This is a criminal act. You know, you guys ought to be impeached, not asking me for sources. And he's going, well, uh, you know, and so, so anyway, so they, they, turn off, they turn off all the cameras. And so I get up and uh, start to walk out. And Elliot Abrams has been called, right? And Elliot Abrams is sitting there and I walk by him. He says, you little prick. He said, you're going to pay for this. He said, I didn't say anything back to him. That was, a, it was one of my better moments. So I just sort of just walked away, right? And he was later, he was later indicted for perjury for his testimony that day, where he said, there's nothing to this. These people are all making this stuff up. It's all a big, you know, fantasy. He said, but, uh, so he got indicted for perjury for that day. So we go, we go ahead and do that. And uh, so I go into the office the next day, and uh, a telephone call has already come. Uh, Patty Austin, my secretary, tells me about it. James Lawrence King has called and said, he's holding you in direct criminal contempt of court for publicly revealing the existence of this lawsuit. Uh, and he's, he's giving you uh, 48 hours to file a, uh, an opposition as to why you should not be held in immediate criminal contempt of court. So I said, oh, great. This is, so I've got 48 hours to do this. So I go back into my office, and then Patty calls me, and she says, there's somebody on the phone. There's somebody on the phone for you. I said, who is it? She says, it's a fellow by the name of Ross Perot is on the phone. So I said, you're right, you're right. So I take the phone, and he goes, hello, Dan? He says, hello, Dan, Ross Perot here. He says, uh, I was looking, Dan, he said, I was, uh, you know, I've been meaning to talk to you. He said, you know, as you know, I'm on the President's National Security Advisory Committee. Uh, I have the brief on the MIAs in Southeast Asia, you know, looking for all these MIAs that are still left back there. You know, and I'm working on that thing. And uh, everybody in my staff has been telling me, you know, look, you ought to call the Sheehan guy over at the Jesuit headquarters. For some reason, he knows all about these same guys that you're looking at. You know, Secord and Shackley and Kleins and all these guys. And so I haven't gotten to it yet, but uh, I was watching C-SPAN uh, yesterday, and I saw that you were on there, and they turned the thing right off. He said, so uh, look it. He said, here's, here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm coming up. I'm coming into Washington in a couple of days. I'm going to be doing the uh, Forrestal lecture, he said, over at the Naval Academy. I'm a graduate of the Naval Academy, you know, Dan. He said, so I'm coming over, and I'm going to be giving them a, 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 the, the old Forrestal lecture, and I'd like to have you come on out to the Academy. Uh, bring a bag, and you can fly with me back to Texas, and we'll talk about all this, right? So I do that. I get, I get a bag, and I get all set, and I get Brian Barger. I get a hold of Barger, uh, who's now at AP, uh, and uh, has just been fired from AP for trying to write stories about this. Turns out that a telegram came right down from the headquarters in New York. Brian Barger is to do no more stories on the Contras. And so he, he, he opposed that, and they fired him. So I bring him over with me to, uh, to, to, see, to see Perot. So we're sitting in the front row, right? And there's like five Skrillian Navy guys, you know, there at the Naval Academy. They're all sitting there in their whites. So we're the only two civvies in the whole place, right? And so he did, he's doing this big talk about how he got all, these, all of his people out of uh, Iran, how he uh, helped escape. He hired a private group that helped his, his uh, workers escape who had been taken hostages there. And we get all done. He comes down to the front. He says, you got to be Dan Sheehan. He said, you know, you're only guys in civvies here. And uh, he says, come on with me. I got to go stand in this big uh, reception line, you know, uh, until, we, until we can fly out of here. So we go stand in the reception line. And we're talking back and forth. He introduces me to uh, uh, Stevenson, uh, the guy that wrote Kiss the Boys Goodbye, who were writing a big book about the missing in action over in Southeast Asia. So we have a long discussion about the heroin smuggling and stuff that's going on there. And then we fly out. 
and we fly down to Texas. And, and uh, Ross and I are in the back of his little jet plane. We're flying along, and uh, I'm telling him about who all these people are and what the whole thing is. And he's going, this is terrible. This is terrible, Dan. He said, as long as these guys are in operation, no man can call himself president. He said, you know, uh, who, who should we tell? Who do you think we should tell about this? I said, well, I've been telling different people about it. And he said, uh, how about George Bush, he says. He says, I know George. George is kind of like a Boy Scout and all this stuff. Uh, he said, uh, I know him really well. I could tell him. I said, well, Ross, I said, uh, uh, it'd probably be better to tell somebody who doesn't already know. Uh, I said, because, because as, it, as it turns out, it's his national security advisor, Donald P. Gregg, that is the former CIA case officer for Felix Rodriguez. And Felix Rodriguez is the head guy at Ilopango running the whole, whole operation. I said, so we should, uh, we sh he said, well, who should we tell? And I said, uh, why, don't, why don't we tell Bill Webster? Bill Webster is the head of the FBI. It's his job. These guys are criminals. They ought to be arrested. He said, okay, good, good, good. He said, I'll, I'll, he says, you, you write up a, a little wire diagram of who all these people are and a little memo about this, and you know, I'll give him a call. He said, you know, Dan, that's one of the advantages in being a billionaire. He says, they'll always take your call. That's what he said. <laughs> So I said, okay, so we'll do this. So I go, to, I go down to Texas with him, you know, and we land there, and he puts me up in this big swanky hotel, this really nifty place with hot and cold running chocolate and everything else, you know. And uh, so I go down the next morning to check out, and he hasn't paid for it. I had to pay for the whole thing, cost $500. I said, what the hell was that? Anyway, so, so he still owes that to me. So, so anyway, so I, I fly back out of there, and I draft up the whole thing, the, the wire diagram, the memo on the whole thing. And uh, I give it to Bob Fink. Bob Fink wanted to go meet Perot. So he wanted to have the favor of being the guy that delivered this to Ross Perot. So Bob Fink goes and delivers it to, to Perot. And Perot takes it and sends it to Bill Webster. A couple days later, I get a call from Danny Colson. Danny Colson is uh, Bill Webster's chief investigator, staff investigator for him. And he and Danny O'Corn had been assigned to go looking into all these guys. And they start looking at all the guys, and I'm going back and forth and back and forth with them, giving them all, all of this information. And the, the criminal indictments have now come out down in Costa Rica against John Hull uh, and all these guys for the murders at La Penca, confirming our close-up charges. Uh, the special pro then, then, we get, uh, then this interesting thing happens. I get, a call, I get a call from Gene Wheaton, who is this guy who was the former chief of security for the U.S. military mission in Tehran, this Farsi-speaking guy, the guy that introduced me to Carl Jenkins that I told you about, the guy that uh, Paul Hovind had met over at the Heritage Foundation, is sitting around. You don't remember that? Okay. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, the, but the bottom line is I get a call from Gene Wheaton, and he calls me over to his office, uh, and, he's, and he tells me, that, oh, look, you know, uh, something has just happened, he said. The, the, turns out that, the, that, the, uh, that North has just has been selling tow missiles to the Hezbollah, and they've got, they're taking part of the money that is being generated by these sales, and they've put them into an offshore bank account to Adolfo Calero, your chief defendant, one of them, you know, and that they're, they're, they're doing that. They're stealing money from the sale of tow missiles to, to, the, to the Hezbollah, right, and, and giving it to the Contras. He said, you know, you should, uh, here's what we're going to do, that I know the guy that's writing the, the uh, autobiography for Bill Casey, and uh, he's going he's gonna to come over to lunch, and you sit down and tell him that you got this information about them, you know, doing this deal with the tow missiles and, and giving the money to the Contras. And you watch what happens. A guy comes over, and I'm sitting having lunch with him, and I'm laying this stuff out to him. And well, he meets with Casey about every two or three days. And so he goes over that night and tells him all about this. Well, that's when the big shredding party started. You know, Oliver, Oliver North in Spawn Hall, you know, going in and, taking documents and shredding them and hiding them in her clothes and all that stuff that she testified about later. Uh, so all of that stuff is going on. And then uh, on just a, a day before Thanksgiving in uh, November, like 24th or so of 1986, Ed Meese comes on television. I get a call from Wheaton, get, come on over to my office. There's something going to be happening. We come, I come over there. We go downstairs to a sports bar, and all of a sudden the bulletin comes on, and Ed Meese comes on the television and announces that they have just discovered that uh, there is a young renegade lieutenant colonel by the name of Oliver North who has gotten out of control and he has gone around basically to all the old golf courses around uh, Washington, D.C., recruiting old uh, former military people and CIA people and have been uh, unlawfully selling weapons to the Contras. 
contrary to all of the denials that have been made all this point. But it's got nothing to do with the administration. It was just a renegade operation. And, the, uh, and Ed Meese is going to be drafting up a charter uh, asking for the appointment of a special prosecutor. Because what that'll do, of course, is it'll stop the FBI investigation. <laughs> it's already going on. So Ed Meese is going to have a, a request a special prosecutor be appointed by the Court of Appeals. And uh, so he drafts up the entire charter, making the only issue to be investigated by the special prosecutor is whether or not the president, in writing, authorized the diversion of a portion of the funds generated by the sale of tow missiles to the Hezbollah to be transferred to the Contras. It would be in violation of the Bolin Amendment. That's the only thing they're authorized to look at. And so he... He brings this uh, petition to the, to the Court of Appeals. They grant it, and they select Lawrence uh, Walsh to be the special prosecutor. And he flies into, he flies into Washington, D.C., and uh, I'm scheduled to be the first meeting that they're going to have. Uh, but I was actually over-briefing uh, Joe Biden, uh, actually, uh, on the Senate Foreign Relations uh, Committee, uh, since they were now, now the Democrats were in charge. Uh, they'd won the election this time, and he's going to be the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, so I'm over briefing him, and uh, I come back to the office, and then they send uh, Colson and Victor O'Corn over to my office, and I sit down and I explain to them. I said, look it, you've got you to understand what this is really all about. The reason that they sold the, the tow missiles to the Hezbollah uh, was because the Hezbollah were blackmailing uh, Oliver North and the other people with him, because the guy who had been sent over to be the CIA station chief in, uh, in uh, Beirut, uh, William Buckley, different William Buckley, but William Buckley had been sent over to be the Beirut station chief. He'd been kidnapped in March of 1984, and he was being tortured. He was being tortured, and they videotaped the torture sessions uh, and sent them, sent a copy of them to Oliver North. And in those torture sessions, William Buckley was, was admitting and laying out the details of a huge political assassination program that was being run uh, over in the Middle East uh, under the auspices of Richard Welch, who had been the former CIA station chief in Athens, uh, who had been murdered. Uh, but now it was being run by this guy Buckley. And it was with the authorization of the president, and it was in a huge violation of human rights, and the guy helping to supervise and train the people that were doing the assassinations was Felix Rodriguez, who is now the number one guy at Ilopango. And so that he laid all this stuff out, and so they videotaped it, sent the videotapes to Oliver North, and North was desperate to keep them from revealing that to the world. And so they blackmailed him, said, if you will give us tow missiles, we will not tell the people of the world about what you've been doing in the Middle East. We'll know it, and you'll know it but we won't tell the rest of the world. And so that's, what, that's how the sale of tow missiles to the, to the Hezbollah took place. And so I told uh, Victor O'Corn that and Danny Colson right away. I said, that's the key to this thing. And once you understand this massive political assassination operation that they had going on, you're going to be right back down into the details of what it was that Frank Church was looking at, that whole political assassination operation that Richard Nixon put together to kill people around the world. Uh, and uh, the smoke started coming out of their ears, and they didn't quite want to hear that. They were trying. To, we have a very narrow, uh, narrow uh, charter here. That, and I said, "Look, that was all done by Mies. Mies did that charter just to keep you guys from looking at the important stuff. It's ridiculous. You won't have any idea about what's going on if you confine yourself to just that investigation." So I, I told him he had to undertake a much larger investigation. So he did. Uh, and he ended up uh, returning uh, indictments against the first six of the people that were uh, named in our lawsuit as being involved in this operation. And when they came to their arraignment, uh, they asked, uh, through their lawyer, Tom Green, they asked that all the criminal cases be continued until they ended up dealing with this major civil lawsuit that was filed down in Florida a year earlier, uh, which was basically making all of the same kind of accusations. And so Judge Gazelle said, uh, I think you've got this backwards. What we'll do is we will, uh, I'll contact the judge on the civil case down there, and we'll postpone any further activity on the case until the criminal cases are all disposed of. Who is the judge down there, he said. And so Tom Green said, it's James Lawrence King. 
He said, oh, I think I've, I think I've heard of Judge King. He said, I'll just, I'll, uh, right after we're done here, I'll go into chambers and I'll call him and I'll get him to agree to postpone any of these, uh, any further activities. So the next morning, uh, we get a call from the clerk of the court of, of Judge uh, James Lawrence King that he wants us down there uh, on the following two days later on Thursday, wants us down there in front of his court at 10 o'clock, actually over in the ceremonial courthouse because that's where the trial is going to be scheduled, right? We knew that. So we go down there, and here, this is a great one. We go down, I got uh, 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 myself and Lewis Pitts, one of our partners, and uh, Rob Hager. We're all down there, and we're waiting for the judge to come out, right, uh, on the bench. And his law clerk is there, who's a guy about our own age, and we're all kidding around with him. And the guy, the guy is sitting, the guy is sitting in the witness seat. He's sitting there in the witness seat like that. And so Lewis Pitts... Our partners goes cruising over to him. He says, well, Mr. Jennings, you know, where were you on the night of four, the 14th of July? You know, he does this. They were just clowning around, fooling around. And so he says that, goes, where were you on the night of the 14th of July? And blah, blah, blah. And the guy goes, well, uh, let me see. I have no present recollection of what it, what it was I was doing. That's a classic lying structure. And it's how they, that's how they instruct organized crime guys. I have no present recollection. That way he's not committing perjury. So he does that funny thing. We're laughing and laughing. And then Judge, Judge King comes out, comes out, and we all rush back to our seats. And we're sitting there looking really serious. And he comes in, and he gets, he gets up on the bench. He says, uh, Mr. Sheehan, he said, you know, we've had uh, almost a year of discovery. I said, yes, Your Honor. In fact, there are like 36 outstanding motions to compel the defendants to, to respond to our, our depositions. He says, that all aside, you've had plenty of time. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm getting set to order this case to trial uh, one week from Monday. And I want you all down here and ready to go to trial. I said, wait a second. I said, what the heck? What is this all about? Uh, oh, I know what it was. And we, we, had said that, we had said to the guy before Judge King came out, Louis Pitts, after we were clowning around with his clerk, we said, hey, what is this all about? Uh, we said, we, we assume this is about Gazelle. The Judge Gazelle must have called Judge King and told him he wanted to postpone everything. Uh, I assume that's what this is all about. He said, well, I don't know what it's all about. He said, but I'm the one that took the call from Gazelle. He says, as his clerk, and I brought the call into him uh, yesterday, so I assume that's what this is about, too. So when, when Judge King starts saying, we're going to go to trial a week from Monday, uh, I said to him, Your Honor, wait a second. Uh, I had assumed that this was going to be about you postponing any further activity in the case until the, the criminal cases are disposed of. He said, no, 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 that's not the way we're going to do it. We're going to go to trial uh, right away, a week from Monday. I want you, all your witnesses down here. I want you to be, I said, Your Honor, we haven't even gotten to do discovery. You haven't even you know, granted our motions to compel any of this discovery. And he said, that, that doesn't make any difference. We're going to trial right now. He said, I said, well, Your Honor, what about the call from Judge Gazelle? And he said, I received no call from Judge Gazelle. He says, he said, what? And he said, I received no call from Judge Gill. Let's go on with this. I'm just telling you, you can be ready for trial. And I want you all down here a week from money. And I said, and Lewis Pitts stood up and he said, Your Honor, wait a second, wait a second. You know, we were just talking to your clerk here before, before you came out. And he told us that Gazelle called. And he took the call and brought it in right to you. And Gazelle and, and uh, Judge King just looks furious like that. He says, are you calling me a liar? He said to Lewis, I wish he'd ask me. <laughs> he said, but he asked, he asked Lewis, and Lewis said, look, I'm not calling you a liar, Your Honor, but, but your clerk just told us that, he, that you got the call from Gazelle, and he brought it in right to you, and now you're telling us you got no call from Gazelle. And he said, okay, Mr. Jennings, he says, you get over here right now, and he puts him in the witness box, puts his own clerk in the witness box, and he says, raise your hand. He said, okay, he said, you swear to tell the truth, hold the truth, again? Said, yes, yes, yes. He says, okay, now, you never received any call, did you? from Gazelle, and you never brought any call into me, did you? And he says, well, I have no present recollection. <laughs> uh, that's what he did, I swear to God, that's exactly what he did. I mean, what is this, you know? And so, so we, all, we all go back home, we all go back home and we start piling all of our depositions and everything into this big 18-wheeler, whatever it was, big gigantic jungle car, or bus that we got, or actually a truck, actually, a big, what do they call it, an 18-wheeler truck. So we fill it all up with computers and all the stuff we're going to do, and we bring it all the way down there, and we, we set it, we get to, we go out to International University, we get a whole bunch of rooms out at the International University where the Miami Dolphins are, are working out so that we get some entertainment. And so so we're, we're down there getting ready to do the trial, right? And so it comes along Thursday afternoon before Monday. Say Thursday afternoon before Monday. It's a, okay. 
All right. So, 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 Judge, so we're, we're sitting there waiting for the trial to start on Monday, and we get a telephone call. And it's a guy from the AP. And he says, uh, what's happened in the case? He said, something big is just happening in the case. We said, what is that? He said, I just got a call. He said, I got a call from Judge King himself and wanted me to come to his chambers and that there'd be a, a motion uh, that something's going to be filed right at 5 o'clock. And, uh, and he's, the guy said, do you know what it is? Do you have any idea what it is? He said, no, he hasn't told us anything about it. And so he said, so he said, we'll go on over there. So we went, well, saddled up and we went on over to the federal courthouse and we go into the courthouse where his chambers are. And it's about maybe 4.30 or something like that. So we all come walking in and Lewis Pitts and, and, uh, and I go walking in and the, his uh, clerk who was there and the secretary just panicked. I mean, they just like freaked out that we'd walk into the office and they go, whoa, whoa. And they turn around and they run back into the room and close the door. And they're in there with Judge King and they come back out and they say, you have to leave now. You have to leave. You're not allowed in here. What are you going to allow in here? It's 4.30 in the afternoon. This is the, the clerk's chamber, the judge's chambers. So why aren't we allowed in here? She says, you just leave right now. You have no right to be here now. Now get out, get out, get out. So she pushes us out and we walk, we go across the hall. We pull some chairs up and we sit down in front of the door. We sit there watching the place like this. And like about quarter to five, along comes the, the clerk or the, the UPI guy or the AP guy, walks in, goes into the, goes into the, into the, the judge's uh, secretary, and they come walking out. And the secretary's got like four or five copies of the thing. And she's walking down the hall like this. So we start walking down the hall with her and we're saying, is that the filing that you're going to be filing? She says, I'm not at liberty to talk about this. And I said, you know, we're the, we're the parties in this, you know, uh, do you have a copy there for us? She says, it'll come to you in the mail. I said, we're going to come to you in the mail. I'm standing right here, you know, why don't you give me a copy of it? It hasn't been filed yet. I said, well, can I get a copy of it after it's been filed? She said, no, it'll come to you in the mail, she said. So we follow her all the way downstairs. We go down to the clerk, and she says, this is to be filed right now. And uh, she says, and you're not to give a copy to these people. She says that to him. So the guy looks kind of puzzled. He, she hands up all the stuff. He stamps it all in. And uh, I said to him, I said, I'm the Daniel Sheehan, the chief counsel here for the plaintiffs. I said, that's my copy. I'd like to have a copy of it, please. And he hands it to me like that. <laughs> so, so I take it. And it's, a sum, it's an order of summary dismissal of the case. Just summarily dismisses the case. Uh, what he does is he declares, he declares the statements of Jack Terrell uh, to be hearsay, completely ignoring the classic exception to the hearsay rule. He, uh, he, uh, he says that the, the testimony by the driver uh, and by the secretary is too tangential of identifying the guy that he went and met with, who was the bomber that had been arrested and was indicted for this now. And then the person who was the eyewitness who saw John Hall with this guy who was indicted for the killings uh, was 22 days before the Lepenka bombing, and it might confuse the jury. They might get confused and think that it was right at the same day of the, of the bombing. And so therefore, you're not going to be allowed to put that evidence in front of the jury. So we're excluding the eyewitness who saw Hull with the guy. We're excluding his secretary who gave him the 50000 We're excluding the driver's testimony. We're excluding John Hull or, or Jack Terrell's testimony. And, oh, all this testimony about, uh, from the attorney general and all of his, uh, his, his investigators and experts, that's all hearsay because you didn't call and take their depositions directly. You know, nobody has to take the depositions of their own witnesses, ever. I mean, all you have to do is list them and represent what they're going to be saying. And the other side has, is obligated to take the deposition if they want to. So he ended up then saying that all of this evidence is going to be excluded. And that therefore, you're unable to prove that, in fact, the bombing that injured your client, Tony Avergon, the ABC television cameraman, has any kind of proximate connection to this ongoing racketeering enterprise that you've laid out here with all the weapon smuggling, drug smuggling, all that kind of stuff. And so it's a, an order of summary judgment. There's nothing for the jury to have to listen to, and you're not going to get any trial at all. And signs an order dismissing the case summarily like that, like on the Thursday afternoon at 5 o'clock before the Monday trial. And so, so that's, how, that's how the uh, pretrial process went uh, in, the, in the court of justice. Uh, and it was only later that we discovered that James Lawrence King had been appointed by Richard Nixon at the request of B.B. Rebozo, and that, in fact, James Lawrence King had been a member of the board of directors of Meyer Lansky's National Bank of Miami, which was the bank through which they, they laundered all the skim off the casinos to help fund the covert operations, including the assassination attempts against Castro. So, 
So that gets us to the point where uh, we will stop for today uh, and we'll then go on to the issue of the appeal process, the congressional hearings, the special prosecutor's investigation, and how the media responded to all of these charges. Okay? All right. <laughs>